Okay, part two of chapter 40. Uh, we'll continue with uh, spinal mobilization of the seated patient. Uh, this is usually going to be uh, from a motor vehicle collision. The patient's still seated within the vehicle, uh, and that's the most common time in which we'll do this. However, this doesn't preclude the, the fact that a patient maybe suffered a spinal injury, got up, walked away, and went and sat down in a chair. Um, I've had to do this out of a recliner before, um, kitchen chairs several times in which patients have, have basically self-extricated, but yet had the mechanism and uh, required the immobilization uh, based off of protocol and uh, is where we ended up you know, in an alternative seated setting uh, doing this. So remember we need a rigid cervical collar appropriately sized and placed. Spinal immobilization advice, usually the vest style which we commonly call a KED, or a short board, which just doesn't come around and doesn't hug them, um, a long backboard, straps, and a head immobilization device, which goes uh, should go hand-in-hand hand with that as well. So <clears throat> we get our device out. Um, this is an example of a KED. Uh, what I don't care for uh, on this picture is it doesn't show the leg straps appropriately stowed. So pay attention when we flip to the next picture, uh, the appropriate way to put your device away is, of course, with the colored straps um, all uh, folded nicely in, in, in the little Velcro uh, retainer. And then the leg straps actually should continue up through the bottom, around the bottom side of the device, coming up on the inside or the other side that we can't see of this device. And actually those little Velcro strips you see on the leg straps come back over the top side and Velcro on to the Velcro on the back, as we see here up by the, the top handle there. So I'll go ahead and I'll flip this over here. You can see them here, where they have the leg straps running up the inside, Velcroed onto the back. That is the correct way to uh, store that, and that's the correct way to insert that device. The reason for this is those leg straps usually are the biggest problem when it comes to using one of these KEDs. They get caught up somewhere, uh, the tangled or something along those lines. Uh, but if you have them appropriately stowed like that, once you get that placed appropriately behind them, then you are going to release those leg straps um, and bring them down one on either side of the patient. And that makes it much, much, much easier to deal with. <clears throat> so you're going to, uh, after you've applied the C collar, and you're going to uh, put the patient, uh, uh, possibly have to have the patient uh, adjusted forward. So if that's the case, you basically will do kind of a sandwich technique. Uh, one rescuer, the rescuer who is currently holding the, the KED, would uh, kind of sandwich the patient um, front and back. And on the count of the, of the person holding the head, would lean the patient forward, slide the device in behind the patient, and usually we'll go down about as far as we can with the bottom of that device. Take those leg straps off, one draped down on, on each respective side of the patient, um, and they'll eventually will have to be pulled into place. So then you're going to align the device, and by aligning the device, you're now going to raise the device up until the arm that fits snugly up into the armpit. It shouldn't be low, it should be high. So bring it up as high as possible so it's in, in the armpit. Remember the spinal column or spinal cord only goes down to the second lumbar vertebrae. So we don't have to worry about immobilizing the tailbone. So it's adjusted upward uh, underneath the armpits. You'll then start to pull the straps across. So when you start to uh, secure the chest straps, uh, there's there is not a correct um, way to do this. Uh, as long as all the straps are secure and tight when you're ready to move the patient, that's all that matters. It doesn't. There's some people who will get really antsy about it has to be in this order, and that's not true. All that matters is that when you're ready to move the device, the patient, that the all are for, securely attached on the device. So in this case, you're going to do middle, bottom. They'll probably then do legs, top, and then head is probably the way they're going to, yep, so we go to legs, so we did middle, we did bottom, 
We're not going to do legs. Remember those leg straps need to be tight. They need to be, you need to rock them back and forth, seesaw them underneath the legs there between the leg and the seat. Get them up as high up as possible and as tight as possible. Securing the head straps on there with Velcro. We're still holding C-spine. Go back. Uh, they're going to tie the hands together. It's a lot of times the patients can do this for you because remember this should be a conscious patient. If you have an unconscious patient, you shouldn't be using this device. So most of the time the patient can hold their hands together for you. They did not go and show you putting the top strap on, but put the top strap on and then you reassure or reassess the security of all of those straps. So when you're reassessing the security of all those straps, make sure they're good and tight. Patient, uh, the, the person at the head is still holding onto the head. Rotate the patient, pivot the patient in their seat. Sometimes their feet will kind of get tangled up in the floor there. That has to happen. In this case, it's posed, so not going to quite work. Sandwich the backboard usually between the patient and the seat, but sometimes it has to be on the rocker panel of the door. Uh, rotate the patient. Um, moving them then on the long axis out onto the backboard um, and then don't forget to uh, release the leg straps and continue securing your patient to the board and then securing to the cot of course uh, securing the head with uh, appropriate head immobilizing device standing longboard for our patients this is actually kind of a fun one uh, if you haven't done one of these uh, we'll make sure and we'll practice this at uh, next skills day but uh, so if we have the ambulating patient, of course, we're going to approach our patient, ask them to hold still, not to move their head, hold their head in a neutral position, uh, apply an appropriately sized C-collar. We'll also need a head immobilizer, straps, and the backboard. Generally, it takes three people to do this. It can be done with two. Not optimal, but it can be done with two. So we apply the cervical mobilization device with our inline stabilization or restriction. Still having somebody positioned behind the backboard, um, uh, holding the head, we position the backboard between that person uh, and the patient. Check for the position uh, of the board from the front so you make sure you're centered nicely. An EMT on each side gets their, their forearms up underneath the patient's armpits. They grasp the next highest handhold on the backboard and their other hands grasp the elbows of the patient to provide additional stabilization of the board. <laughs> Lower the patient to the ground. Basically this is all off of the count of the person holding the head, remember. So we slowly just tilt them backwards. The, patient or the person holding the head slowly walks themselves back. When we get them down to the ground, we finally immobilize them with the appropriate straps. Necessary, we shift them upward on the backboard. Uh, and the long axis of the body, again, with the person at the head being in charge. Rapid extrication. Um, should we have a patient that is uh, not eligible for, uh, a C uh, for a KED or a Vestal device, we need to get them out because of their medical condition and we have access to them. Um, and if we need to get them moved immediately um, because of their own condition or because they're blocking access to another injured patient, um, or there's an immediate danger. That's the cases in which rapid extrication would occur. We do not rapidly extricate people simply for our own convenience. So this is going to require C-collar, backboard, straps, and a head immobilizer. So remove any other patient with the potential for spinal injury from the vehicle using a short backboard or vest style device. All right, so in some cases, the vehicle may be damaged to the point which access to perform extrication is limited. And in those cases, we're going to have to do uh, every additional heavy rescue things, such as removing roofs, spreading dashes, and so on and so forth. So still, immobilizing the, the head with uh, manual stabilization. Apply a C-collar when, when possible. Do your quick primary assessment. Apply some oxygen as necessary. Well, the other, while one maintains C-spine stabilization, if we can apply a collar, fantastic. Otherwise, then we start to rotate the patient in small increments by communicating with each other. Pull the patient out onto the backboard. It's best to go uh, to take them out head first. That's the easiest way to go. 
uh, but sometimes we have to do foot first, and if that's the case, we have to do that. It's easiest to go with the long axis of the body. So we move out via the long axis of the body, get placed up against the patient's buttocks, the head end of the board, um, you know, we have people holding on to the board so we can get this person out. And then while maintaining in a neutral position, um, the patient then reclined onto the long spine board and slid outward. The long spine board is then slid into the proper position on the stretcher, and the patient is secured. The head is immobilized and secured with appropriate CID. Helmet removal. Um, occasionally we're faced with a, a patient wearing a helmet. Um, if the helmet fits well, it allows for access to the airway, and we can immobilize the patient using padding beneath the torso, leave it alone. That's best to leave it alone if you can. If it does not fit well, we cannot access the airway, or we can't properly immobilize the patient with the helmet in place, then take it off. Sometimes we just need to modify what we're doing. Sometimes we just need to move a face mask. So let's take a football player, for example. If we have a patient with uh, his big football helmet on and the cage over the face and they have a big set of shoulder pads on, um, if we remove their helmet but leave their shoulder pads in place, we're going to have to do a lot of work to immobilize and, and support the head. So that's something to, to keep in mind to... Uh, uh, you know, why not leave the helmet in place? We could just simply pull the face mask off. Usually we can do that with a set of, of shears or some sp or a tool that we can get from the coach uh, to quickly remove the, the face mask of the helmet so we can get to their airway and we have uh, the ability to uh, uh, get to the patient's face. So if we have to pull off a full face motorcycle helmet, EMT1 will grasp the face mask portion of the helmet to maintain manual stabilization of the head and neck. EMT2 will remove any chin strap. EMT2 will then grasp the mandible of the patient with one hand and support the posterior neck with the other. So basically you're holding them front and back um, as opposed to side and side like we have typically done. EMT1 will slowly and gently remove the helmet and as the helmet progresses upward the EMT number Two will slowly adjust their hands and get them into place to provide more and more manual stabilization. Eventually, um, after EMT number one gets the helmet off, EMT one can take over uh, if necessary. So that's a full face motorcycle helmet. Um, if we have an open face helmet, either motorcycle or sports or whatever, EMT one performs manual stabilization of the head and neck. Two will remove the strap. Two then starts to remove the helmet while EMT1 maintains the manual stabilization of the head and neck. Usually this is by uh, uh, EMT1's got his hands kind of up inside the helmet with his fingers trying to support as much as possible inside the helmet while EMT2 is working that helmet off. Um, then EMT2 applies appropriate size C collar and they maintain manual stabilization of the head and neck. So a couple special considerations, uh, football related injuries, when they're wearing pads, shoulder pads, it will be hard to put them into a neutral position while lying supine. So if we're having to remove a helmet, we may need to also remove the pads. So the helmet's removed and the play, player's placed in supine position, they're hyperextended. So, and in most cases, football helmets are fitted to the player and they don't allow much movement. However, if you have a good working relationship with your uh, sports medicine folks or your coaches, you guys can work together uh, in case you would need to remove a helmet. They can show you some of the tips and tricks. Some of them simply takes uh, uh, just a little, like almost like a paper clip, unfolded paper clip. You stick it inside a little hole and it pops, pops loose some of the rivets and uh, will allow you to very quickly take the mask off. Others, um, if you have, if you know where the right spot is, you can release the the air cushions that are uh, in the helmet, uh, and it makes removal of the helmet much easier. 
um, some uh, pieces of equipment you might want to have, either some anvil shears like they show on the left or an extractor, which is actually intended to uh, work on helmets. Uh, those can both be used to help clip the little plastic clips on the side of a football helmet that will help get that mask off rather quickly. So removing a uh, face mask from a football helmet. So perform stabilization of the head and neck by grasping the helmet at the sides. Uh, remove those mask clips. Cut the side clips first, then cut the top clip. Cut the clips using either the anvil shears or the extractor. And once the clips are cut, you can remove the face mask and immobilize that patient onto the long spine board. Granted, if we need to do CPR on this person, then the shoulder pads have to go. This is a case in which we're going to leave the helmet in place because it helps keep them in alignment. So as appropriate, we may have to remove the helmet, and if so, take care not to manipulate the spine uh, using the same basic methods as the uh, open-faced helmet. If you remove the helmet, try to remove the shoulder pads. Otherwise, you have to pad. Patient's condition requires access to their chest. Cut those front strings on the shoulder pads. That secures the shoulder pads. That will allow you to spread them apart, slide them over the patient or from beneath the patient. Infants and children, same basic concepts as immobilizing as we do with uh, adults with the thought process that remember the younger the kid is, the larger the head. So patting under the shoulders becomes more of, of a concern. So we may need to put a roll, uh, a folded towel or use a specially uh, designed device that has a little drop off that allows the head to then slip down into kind of a little groove so it is not pushed forward. Use appropriate size C collars. All right, we've reached the end of this chapter. So if significant mechanism of injury is present and, and or the patient exhibits the appropriate signs or symptoms, uh, immobilize. If immobilization is not indicated, you will not immobilize them. Doing so will cause undue stress and discomfort. Sometimes these people lay on these backboards for four, six, eight hours. Um, when immobilizing, it's vital that you do so appropriately, following your protocols, regularly assessing the CSM. Inappropriate immobilization techniques can lead to additional injury uh, and can leave the patient permanently disabled. And the care you provide to the spinally injured patient must like reduce the likelihood of worsening their condition and possibly a devastating lifelong illness or injury.